The prodigiously talented actress and theatre director Kate Blanchett has filled her CV with critically acclaimed work. At just past 40, the ethereal beauty has won multiple acting awards and featured opposite some of the world's greatest leading men, in between raising a family of three boys with her writer husband Andrew Upton. Her punishing schedule would bring lesser mortals to their knees, but Kate has always risen to the challenge. In 2008, she was taking it all in her stride. Well, it's, I'm in a, an, an incredible situation at the moment, having played, you know, been offered two extraordinary parts, and then my husband and I have just taken over as co-artistic directors of the Sydney Theatre Company, which is a very new and huge responsibility for us and a huge focus in, in Australia. And I'm also pregnant, so I sort of am pulled in quite a few directions, which is nice because it means that you can just take the enjoyable bits from the nominations and not get caught up in the pressure. Kate was born Catherine Elise in Melbourne, Australia in 1969 to an Australian teacher and an American petty officer in the Navy, who died when Kate was just 10. Along with her older brother and younger sister, she completed her schooling in Melbourne before moving to Sydney to train at renowned acting school NIDA. In her first major stage role, she was lucky enough to be cast opposite Geoffrey Rush in the David Mamet play Oleana. In 2007, at the premiere of Elizabeth the Golden Age, Jeffrey remembered his introduction to the actress. I come like a marker because I saw Kate in her final year at drama school and was, you know, just as an audience member, completely astonished by her capabilities. And then the following year we got to do a play together and we did some more theatre. And then ten years ago we ended up on a soundstage at Shepperton, dressed as Queen Elizabeth I of Walsingham and going, how do we get here? What happened? Many of Kate's most praised performances have come via her portrayals of real historical figures. It was the eternally fascinating Virgin Queen Elizabeth I who delivered Kate her first major hit. Any controversy surrounding the decision to revisit English history in the 16th century with an Indian director and two Australian leads was silenced when the film was released. Kate wasn't surprised to see the film directed by Shikhar Kapoor attract a massive audience as well as multiple awards, including an Oscar and six BAFTAs. When, when we look back on that age, we can, you know, when we study it in school, we, it's a very textbook, quite dry way of looking at history, when in fact they lived and breathed, they had sex, they felt anger, rage, envy, um, and incredibly violent thoughts, and they also had this incredible poetic sensibility. I think it's when language in a lot of ways in, in England was at its um, great height. Nine years later, Kate and Geoffrey revisited the royal court. In Elizabeth the Golden Age, the now mature queen faces many challenges to her status. After spending so much time studying her all-powerful alter ego, Kate was left in no doubt as to why Elizabeth has proved irresistible to filmmakers and audiences alike. I think it intrigues so many people. If you think about the legacy of actresses who've played this role, from you know Betty Davis and um, Flora Robson and Glenda Jackson and Helen Mirren and Anne-Marie Duff, Judi Dench, um, and the women who will play it, I think it's partly because the fascination with the monarchy is we want to know what goes on behind closed doors, what goes on behind the face of power. In 2002, she played a very different heroine. Charlotte Grey, an adaptation of the best-selling novel by Sebastian Fox, was based on the story of female secret service agents working in France during World War II. At the charity premiere screening, Kate met Nancy Wake, who fought with the resistance and found out that adapting a much-loved book has its own pressures. But Sebastian did write me a letter the other week saying that he loved it. And he's a film critic as well as a novelist, and he said that it worked as a film. And I think that's the most important thing, because it's such a complex book, and she's such a complex character. And um, it's a very difficult thing to sort of realise that on screen. But hopefully we've maintained the spirit of the novel as we perceive it, you know. Had me in tears this <laughs> oh, well, I mean, maybe that, well, I'm glad that worked for you. She'd also met some real-life members of the resistance. We were lucky enough to meet a couple, and a couple here tonight, which is um, incredible. I mean, in the end, we're just making films, you know, but these people have actually lived it. Uh, and uh, I'd been in production of Plenty on the West End, so the territory of the SOE was not unfamiliar to me. 
but to actually meet the women who'd gone through this was you can't beat that because it, it, it hits home to you that it did actually happen. The following year, Kate's famous ear for accents had to adapt again, this time to portray the Irish journalist Veronica Gurin, who was murdered for exposing drug lords. It is a particular challenge when you're playing someone who lived and died so recently and has been so claimed by the Irish public. But you can't play an icon or a saint, you have to play a human being. Veronica staged a two-year war against the drug barons in the pages of Dublin's Sunday Independent newspaper before she was shot dead at the wheel of her car in 1996. Kate spent a month in Dublin before the shoot, talking to the journalists, families and friends, watching footage and reading articles. She found Veronica's world both fascinating and shocking. I wanted to do a lot of research. I mean, that's why I do what I do. I mean, that's the interesting part, because I didn't really know very many details about Veronica. I knew what she'd um, obviously that she died and the paper that she worked for and what she was trying to achieve and but I didn't know the details of it and I certainly didn't know the depth of the problem the drug problem that had developed in the 80s uh, in Dublin I had no idea about that so I found that fascinating and also knowing in retrospect now what she was going through personally at, at the time and then watching her television interviews and her radio interviews um, I found it very fascinating and moving what she couldn't say and the way she dealt with the pressure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those, those are all things that I wanted to do. In 2004, Kate played an influential woman of a very different kind in Martin Scorsese's The Aviator. Catherine Hepburn earned immortality both as a Hollywood actress and as the lover of billionaire entrepreneur Howard Hughes and Kate was well aware that her portrayal of the Golden Age icon would be closely watched. There's enormous weight of expectation, you know, that when you're playing Hepburn, you're, you know that the role's going to be scrutinised in a way that perhaps another role wouldn't be. So you just have to do a lot of preparation, you know, and then be brave enough to chuck it all away and just play the scenes. Although the story of the rise and fall of the eccentric Howard Hughes appeared to be a very American story, Kate felt it would reach a wide audience. I look. I think the the influence of the you know the so-called golden age of Hollywood is um, is global, and I think that you know the fan base of people like you know actors like Ava Gardner and um, Gene Harlow and Hepburn is you know it's not just particularly American. And the great thing about you know when you work with a genius like Scorsese, his work transcends his particular culture, and he's talking about you know an individual, a remarkable individual. She pushed the bar even higher in her most recent biopic. The multi-award winning I'm Not There took a novel approach to telling the story of Bob Dylan, with seven actors playing different parts of the singer and songwriter's personality. Kate took on the challenge alongside Heath Ledger, Christian Bale and Richard Gere, and considered the film more like a riff on a creative personality than a biography. And she loved the creative freedom it brought. Well, I was liberated from that in, in the very fact that I'm female, playing him so you, the audience knows that none of us are playing Dylan, none of us are called Dylan so it wasn't about you know an imitation, it's a much more kind of poetic surreal rendition of um, whatever the facts are you know so I was I found it utterly liberating to tell you the truth. Kate Blanchett has shown a virtuosity in her character work that extends beyond the biographical and into fictional roles as diverse as an ex-heroin addict, a psychic and a criminal school teacher. In 1997, she landed her first leading role in an adaptation of Peter Carey's Oscar and Lucinda by Australian director Gillian Armstrong. The film, co-starring Ralph Fiennes, centers on a tragic romance between two compulsive gamblers. After the breakthrough success of Elizabeth, she moved on to the Oscar Wilde classic An Ideal Husband. The play had first found its way to the big screen in 1947. Suddenly in 1999, two remakes were fighting for the audience's attention. Kate starred in the Icon Films production, which was set in 1895 and directed by Oliver Parker. 
She got to share the screen with a stellar cast, including Minnie Driver and Rupert Everett. Oh, I, Minnie is one of the funniest people I've ever met, and Rupert is just, he's, he's so dry. So, and, and one of the reasons why I thought it would be a fun film to do is that I found Oliver had such a, um, a wicked sense of humour. So there, were, there, there was a lot of levity and, and laughter in the filmmaking. And I think that's a really good thing because the dilemma that Gertrude and Robert go, go through is they're so earnest about it. And um, so it was great to be surrounded, I think, by that levity. But there's an enormous melancholia, I think, that underpins um, an ideal husband as well. Next up, she appeared as the troubled psychic Annie Wilson in the Sam Raimi picture The Gift, co-starring Keanu Reeves. Playing Annie called for a much quieter and internalised performance than many of her earlier characters. Oh, after, after I actually made Elizabeth, there were a lot of offers to, I think, to make, you know, to sort of recreate that role, but just call her a different name, you know, with or without the corset. And I didn't find that particularly interesting. And I found it really liberating to sort of play character roles so I could just keep working and trying out different things. Because, I mean, you know, you try things out, some things work, some things don't, but you, you know. Um, and I really loved this story. I'd never seen a film like it. For the next few years, her services were intermittently required on the set of the Lord of the Rings trilogy where she played the role of Galadriel, the fairest elf of them all. In 2004, she appeared opposite Tommy Lee Jones in The Missing, a suspense thriller set in 19th century New Mexico. Kate played a young farmer whose eldest daughter is kidnapped by a psychopathic magician. Tommy Lee portrayed her estranged father. But for Kate, the greatest challenge was learning to ride a horse. Yes, I'm quite urban. I don't like to be too far away from an espresso machine. Um, but I promised Ron I could do it. And I think when you make a promise to Ron Howard, you have to deliver. And there's, I mean, it's very different than going on a holiday and, and thinking you might horse ride. When you know the cameras are going to roll in six weeks, you've got to be able to bloody well do it. And particularly when you're, when you're riding alongside someone like Tommy Lee, who's a consummate horseman and knows everything there is to know about the Southwest. So, um, I mean, he was an enormous lexicon for me and was really generous with his knowledge. The same year saw the release of a unique comedy. The Life Aquatic with Steve Zizou was a Wes Anderson production starring Bill Murray as a world famous oceanographer whose career is on the wane. Kate played a journalist, writing a piece on Steve Zizou's mad hunt for a mythical shark. Bill's very unpredictable and I think that he was probably, I think in his reaction to seeing the film it seemed he was quite which you never would have guessed at the time, quite confronted as to how horrible and unlikable Steve Zissou is. Um, because Bill is a character that we all embrace because he's, he's entertained us and surprised us for, for so long. Um, so he, but he's a very um, unpredictable performer, and I really like that because you never know which angle he's coming from next. In between films, Kate made her way back to Australia, for a theatre production of Hedda Gabler. And while she was there, she played the role of Tracy Hart in the homegrown film Little Fish. Tracy is a 32-year-old ex-junkie trying to get her life together. And Kate found something in her character to connect with. I think it's, I mean, in, in, in every, every single person I know in some way has felt they've let themselves down. They felt that they've missed an opportunity. And I, I know a lot of people and I felt, you know, my early part of my 20s, I felt like things were slipping away from me. And, you know, when you come out of drama school and you don't start working, I mean, not to the extent that Tracy has, obviously, but I think everyone can relate to that. And it's how, it's how you pick yourself up that's a testament to your character. And I, I find her struggle. Um, all, all the characters' struggles really, um, really endearing and quite heartbreaking. Even by Kate's lofty standards, 2006 was to prove an exceptional year. As well as starring in the multi-award winning Babel alongside Brad Pitt as American tourists caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, she got up close and personal with George Clooney in the espionage thriller A Good German, directed by Steven Soderbergh. The same year, she also made the bold choice to play a school teacher who starts up a relationship with one of her students in the highly acclaimed Notes on a Scandal. I do. I, I love characters 
presented warts and all. I mean, I think that's the, you know, the, otherwise what, what's there to, to play if there's no dilemma, if there's no um, journey for a character, it becomes very bland. The psychological thriller pitted Kate against Dame Judi Dench as an obsessive middle-aged colleague who comes to learn of Sheba's affair. I think there's a difference between being a bad person and doing, um, performing bad actions and, and definitely having sex with a minor is not something to be condoned. But it's, it's drama and I think that that's great stuff to, to act with. It's an enormous dilemma, an incredibly heavy secret to, to, to carry around. And so the, I think the, the, the exciting and delicious thing for an audience is that she unburdens herself to the, the worst person in the world, um, who is Barbara Covert. More recently, Kate signed up to play a Russian officer in the long-anticipated return of Indiana Jones. And in the curious case of Benjamin Button, she reunited with her Babel co-star Brad Pitt to tell the story of a man who ages in reverse. Over the course of her relatively short film career, Kate has already amassed a staggering tally of awards and nominations. Her first leading role in Oscar and Lucinda saw her nominated for an AFI and a Film Critics Circle of Australia award. But it was her turn as Elizabeth that propelled her into another league. Her acclaimed performance in the period drama earned her a nomination for an Academy Award. Kate joined her co-nominees for the Academy lunch ahead of the ceremony. Um, I can't tell you how proud I am that per capita I think Australia has the highest number of nominees, you know, <laughs> and, which is wonderful and you know so I think that there are a lot of um, phone calls and congratulations and it's I mean I, I think Jeffrey is one of Australia's greatest exports so I'm happy to be counted you know as one of his peers. She was also nominated for and won an incredible 12 awards for her portrayal of the young queen. Her haul included a Golden Globe and a BAFTA award. For almost every appearance since Elizabeth Kate has been nominated for or won at least one award. Her next major coup came in the wake of her portrayal of Catherine Hepburn in Martin Scorsese's The Aviator. She was nominated for a Best Supporting Oscar and according to pre-ceremony buzz, Kate was a shoe in for the gong. At the pre-Oscar lunch, she took her place alongside other prospective winners and she thanked Catherine Hepburn for her place at the table. It's surreal, you know, um, the Academy has obviously honoured her so many, and rightly so, so many times. So this is sort of her, just another, I mean, from the grave she's still being nominated. <laughs> and without her there would be no role. So it is quite surreal. Pre-Oscar nerves aside, Kate was looking forward to the ceremony, whatever the outcome. If you can't enjoy it, if you can't enjoy the pleasure of being nominated, then I did. It's crazy, you've got to enjoy it. There's plenty of times in one's career when people are, you know, not celebrating your performances, so you've, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. No doubt she was even more thrilled to hear her name called, to step up and collect the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. She also won a BAFTA and six other awards for the same role. For her daring performance in I'm Not There, she took out her second Golden Globe, along with the Volpe Cup for Best Actress. In total, she won 10 awards for her portrayal of Bob Dylan and was nominated for seven more, including an Academy Award. In the same year, she also won her second Best Actress nomination for her role as the British Queen in Elizabeth the Golden Age. That double whammy made her one of only 11 actors to have two acting nominations in the same year. Back in 2006, Babel had garnered Kate and her castmates an Ensemble Performance Award at the Palm Springs International Film Festival. And Kate was honored with a Career Achievement Award, despite being only 36. Oh, look, it's brilliant. I mean, a career achievement. It's sort of, it's a very strange thing to receive. But I sort of feel a bit young for it, really. But um, no, I'm thrilled. And to be part of the Ensemble of Babel, is, um, I'm really proud of the film. Somewhere within her incredibly busy schedule, Kate has found the time to have three children with her husband Andrew Upton, whom she met in 1996 and married in 97. 
Dashiell was born in 2001, Roman in 2004, and Ignatius in 2008. For all her fame and fortune, Kate isn't immune to the rigors of working motherhood. In 2003, while researching her role as Veronica Gorin, she found a resonance with a journalist's battle to balance her work with her family life. And I suppose on an unconscious level, not consciously, there must have been some sort of um, deeper understanding of what it meant to have a child and, you know, that being, having to tear yourself away from your work to be with your child and having to tear yourself away from your child to be with your work. I mean, that's the balance of life with, you know, parents who work. Although she is best known for her film career, Kate has maintained her love of theatre, appearing in many productions internationally and in Australia. In 1999, she even met the Queen after appearing in the David Hare play, Plenty. In 2008, Kate and her playwright husband signed a contract with the Sydney Theatre Company to serve as artistic co-directors for three years. Directing one of the leading contemporary theatres in the country offers the couple an incredible opportunity to bring their vision to the Australian stage. An early partnership agreement with New York's Labyrinth Theatre Company saw Andrew's play Rifle Mind directed by Philip Seymour Hoffman. As Kate and her family relocated from Brighton in England to Sydney, rumours did the round that she might be thinking of retiring. But Kate was quick to set the record straight. I think Australia is, for me, has always been, and for my husband, it's a wealth of opportunities. It's not like going back and life ends. It sort of feels like life begins in a way. And that's the theatrical community that we're from, our family's there. and. You know, I'm always, every time I make a film, every time I do a play, I'm always saying, that's it, I'm never doing it again. And it's just great, because every time you do a project, you have to be seduced back. Keen to plough her artistic experience and knowledge back into the community, Kate chaired a creative panel at the 2008 Ideas Summit, convened by the new Australian Labour government to glean ideas and inspiration from leading Australians. And on a more surface level, Kate is also the face of skincare range SK2. I'm here today um, on behalf of SK2. I've been working with the brand in Australia for, um, officially as an ambassador for about three years, but unofficially um, as an ambassador for about seven. When I discovered the project, I'm, I'm the product, I'm quite evangelical about it. And now I'm going global with them, which I was absolutely flattered that they asked me. Although she currently lives in Australia, Kate continues to indulge her love of high fashion during trips overseas. As a front row guest at Oak Couture events and catwalk shows, she gets to sit back and let others do the entertaining.